Welcome to our podcast, and this week at London Visited, we do something slightly different. We feature someone famous to do with London, to tell you all about this individual and their connection with London. My name's Steve, and each week I'm going to bring you to you the facts, history, and information about different things related to this great capital. If you've been to London, are planning on visiting, live here, or just love London from afar, then this is the podcast for you. Also, don't forget to visit our YouTube channel, London Visited, to see videos covering so many places and so many things you can do across London. Now, to this week's podcast. If you're a regular listener to London Visited podcasts or watch our videos on our sister channel, you will have heard the name John Nash mentioned many times when talking about many of the different London landmarks. John Nash was a famous architect And although Sir Christopher Wren is one of the most famous ones that is known for London, John Nash was equally as popular at the time and also famous for creating so many different places. At the end of today's podcast, I'll actually list all of the different things he was involved in either building or alternatively designing. So let's have a look at John Nash right from birth through to his death. John Nash was born during 1972 in Lambeth, South London, and he was the son of a Welsh millwright, also called John. From 1766, John Nash trained with the architect Sir Robert Taylor. The apprenticeship was completed in 1775. In the same year, at the now demolished church of St Mary Newington, Nash married his first wife, Jane Elizabeth Kerr, daughter of a surgeon. Initially, he seems to have pursued a career as a surveyor, builder and carpenter. This gave him an income of around £300 a year. The couple set home at the Royal Row Lambeth. He established his own architectural practice in 1777, as well as being in partnership with the timber merchant, Richard Heaveside. The couple had two children. In June 1778, by the ill conduct of his wife, found it necessary to send her to Wales in order to work a reformation on her. The cause of this appears to have been the claim that Jane Nash had imposed two spurious children on him as his and her own notwithstanding she had then never had any child, and she had contracted several debts unknown to her husband, including one for Milner's bills of £300. The claim that Jane had faked her pregnancies and then passed babies which she had acquired off as her own was brought before the consistory court of the Bishop of London. His wife was sent to Aberfern to lodge with Nash's cousin, Anne Morgan, but she developed a relationship with a local man, Charles Charles. In an attempt at reconciliation, Jane returned to London in June 1779, but she continued to act extravagantly, so he sent her to another cousin, Thomas Edwards of Neath. She gave birth just after Christmas and acknowledged Charles Charles as the father. In 1781, Nash instigated action against Jane for separation on the grounds of adultery. The case was tried at Hereford in 1782. Charles, who was found guilty, was unable to pay the damages of £76 and subsequently died in prison. The divorce was finally read in January 1787. His career was initially unsuccessful and short-lived. After inheriting £1,000 in 1778 from his uncle Thomas, he invested the money in building his first known independent works, 15 to 17 Bloomsbury Square and 66 to 71 Great Russell Street in Bloomsbury. But the property failed to let and he was declared bankrupt in September 1783. His debts were £5,000 including £2,000 he had been lent by Robert Adam and his brothers. A blue plaque commemorating Nash was placed on 66 Great Russell Street by English Heritage not long ago in 2013. In June 1797, he moved into 28 Dover Street, a building of his own design. He built a larger house next door at 29, into which he moved the following year. Nash married 25-year-old Mary Ann Bradley in December 1798 in Hanover Square. Also in the same year, he purchased a plot of land, 30 acres, at East Cowes, on which he put up East Cowes Castle as his residence. It was the first series of picturesque Gothic castles that he would design. Nash's final home in London was number 14 Regent Street that he also designed and built from 1819 to 1823. Number 16 was built at the same time as the home of Nash's cousin, John Edwards, a lawyer who handled all of Nash's legal affairs. Located in Lower Regent Street near Waterloo Place, both houses formed a single design around an open courtyard. Nash's drawing office was on the ground floor. On the first floor, it was the finest room in the house, a 70-foot long picture and sculpture gallery. It linked to the drawing room at the far end of the building, with the dining room at the rear. 
The house was sold in 1834 and the gallery interior moved to East Cowes Castle. The finest of a dozen country houses that Nash designed as picturesque castles include the relatively small Luscombe Castle in Devon, Ravensworth Castle, Tyne and Weir, also Carahays Castle in Cornwall, and also Shanbelly Castle in County Tipperary. Nash, as well as building lots of other houses and also sculpturing gardens, also advised on work for the buildings of Jesus College in Oxford in 1815 for which required no fee, but he asked that the college should commission a portrait of him from Sir Thomas Lawrence, who hung it in the college hall. Nash was a dedicated Whig, and he was a friend of Charles James Fox, through whom Nash probably became to the attention of the Prince Regent, later King George IV. In 1806, Nash was appointed architect to the Surveyor General of Woods, Forests, Parks and Chases. From 1810, Nash would take very few private commissions, and for the rest of his career, he would work largely for the prince. His employment by the prince regent enabled Nash to embark upon a great number of grand architectural projects. His first major commissions in 1809 to 1826 from the prince were Regent Street and the development of an area then known as Marylebone Park. With the regent's backing, Nash created a master plan for the area and put it into effect from 1818 onwards, which stretched from St James's northwards and included Regent Street, Regent's Park and its neighbouring streets, terraces and crescents of elegant townhouses and villas. Nash did not design all the buildings himself. In some instances, these were left in the hands of other architects, such as James Pennythorne and the young Decimus Burton. Nash went on to re-landscape St James's Park in 1814, reshaping the formal canal into the present lake and giving the park its present form. A characteristic of Nash's plan for Regent Street was that it followed a regular path linking Portland Place to the north, with Carlton House, London, replaced by Nash's Carlton House Terrace, to the south. At the northern end of Portland Place, Nash designed Park Crescent, and this opens into Nash's Park Square. This only has terraces on the east and west. The north opens into Regent's Park. The terraces that Nash designed around Regent's Park, though conforming to the earlier formers appearing as a single building, as developed by John Wood the Elder, are unlike earlier examples set in gardens. This was part of Nash's development of planning, This found it to be the most extreme example when he set out Park Village East and Park Village West, to the northeast of Regent's Park. Here, a mixture of detached villas, semi-detached houses, both symmetrical and asymmetrical in their design, are set out in private gardens railed off from the street. The roads loop and the buildings are both classical and gothic in style. No two buildings were the same, or even in line with their neighbours. The Park Villages can be seen as the prototype for the Victorian suburbs. Hi there, and thanks so much for listening to this podcast on the history of London. And if you're enjoying this, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up on YouTube. Now, if you want to get more involved with London Visited, don't forget you can join us as a member by going to patreon.com forward slash London Visited with so many different benefits. Or you can purchase a 4K photograph of London from our website, londonvisited.co.uk, both of which support us and keep the channel going. Once again, thanks for listening. And now back to the podcast. Nash was employed by the Prince from 1815 to develop his Marine Pavilion in Brighton. Originally designed by Henry Holland, by 1822 Nash had finished his work on the Marine Pavilion, which was now transformed into the Royal Pavilion. The exterior was based on Mughal architecture, giving the building its exotic form. The chinensary style interiors are largely the work of Frederick Crace. Nash was also the director of the Regent's Canal Company set up in 1812 to provide a canal link from West London to the River Thames in the east. Nash's master plan provided for the canal to run around the northern edge of Regent's Park. As with other projects, he left his execution to one of his assistants, in this case, James Morgan. The first phase of the Regent's Canal was completed in 1816 and finally completed in 1820. Together with Robert Smirk and also Sir John Soane, he became an official architect to the Office of Works in 1813 at a salary of £500 per annum. Following the death in September of that year of James Wyatt, This marked the high point of his professional life. As part of Nash's new position, he was invited to advise the parliamentary commissioners on the building of new churches from 1818 onwards. Nash produced 10 church styles, each estimated to cost around £10,000, with seating for 2,000 people. The style of the buildings were both classical and gothic. In the end, Nash only built two churches for the commission, the classical All Souls Church, Langham Place, terminating at the north end of Regent Street, and the Gothic St Mary's Haggerston, bombed during the Blitz in 1941. 
Nash was also involved in the design of two of London's theatres, both in Haymarket, the King's Opera House, now rebuilt as Her Majesty's Theatre, where he and George Repton remodelled the theatre, with arcades and shops around three sides of the building, the fourth being the still-surviving Royal Opera Arcade. The other theatre was the Theatre Royal Haymarket, with its fine, hexy-style Corinthian Order portico, which still survives, facing down Charles II Street to St James's Square. Nash's interior no longer survives. The interior now dates from 1904. In 1820, a scandal broke, when a cartoon was published showing a half-dressed King George IV embracing Nash's wife, with a speech bubble coming from the king's mouth containing the words, I have great pleasure in visiting this part of my dominions. Whether this was based on just a rumour, or put about by people who resented Nash's success, or if there was substance behind it, is unknown. Further London commissions for Nash followed, including the remodelling of Buckingham House to create Buckingham Palace, and the Royal Mews, and Marble Arch. The arch was originally designed as a triumphal arch to stand at the entrance to Buckingham Palace. It was moved when the east wing of the palace designed by Edward Bloor was built, at the request of Queen Victoria, whose growing family required additional domestic space. Marble Arch became the entrance to the Hyde Park and the Great Exhibition. Nash's career effectively ended with the death of King George IV in 1830. The King's notorious extravagance had generated much resentment and Nash was now without a protector. The Treasury started to look closely at the cost of Buckingham Palace. Nash's original estimate of the building's costs had been £252,690, but this had risen to £496,169 in 1829. The actual cost was £613,269, and the building was still unfinished. This controversy ensured that Nash would not receive any more official commissions, nor would he be awarded the knighthood that other contemporary architects, such as Geoffrey Whiteville, John Soane, and Robert Smirk received. Nash retired to the Isle of Wight to his home, East Cowes Castle. On the 28th of March, 1835, Nash was described as very poorly and faint, and this was the beginning of the end. On the 1st of May, Nash's solicitor, John Whitted Lyon, was summoned to East Cowes Castle to finalise his will. By the 6th of May, he was described as very ill indeed all day. He died at his home on the 13th of May. His funeral took place in St James's Church, East Cowes, on the 20th of May, where he was buried in the churchyard, where the monument takes the form of a stone sarcophagus. His widow acted to clear Nash's debts, some £15,000. She held a sale of the castle's contents, including three paintings by J. M. W. Turner, painted on the Isle of Wight, two by Benjamin West, and several copies of old master paintings by Richard Evans. These artworks were sold at Christie's in July 1835 for £1,061. His books, medals, drawings and engravings were bought by a bookseller named Evans for £1,423 in July. The castle itself was sold for a reported figure of £20,000 to Henry Boyle, 3rd Earl of Shannon, within the year. Nash's widow retired to a property Nash had bequeathed to her in Hampstead, where she lived until her death in 1851. These are the works that Nash was involved with in London. Park Crescent, Carlton House, Southborough House, Regent Street, Regent's Canal, Royal Lodge, Carlton House, Trafalgar Square, The Rotunda in Woolwich, the King's Opera House in Haymarket, on the site of Her Majesty's Theatre, Waterloo Place, the County Fire Office, Piccadilly Circus, Suffolk Place, Haymarket, the Haymarket Theatre, 14 to 16 Regent Street, Nash's own house, York Gate, the Church of All Souls, Langham Place, Hanover Terrace, Royal Mews, Sussex Place, Albany Terrace, Park Square, Park Village East and West, Cambridge Terrace, Landscaping of King's Road, Ulster Terrace, Buckingham Palace, the State Rooms and Western Front, Clarence House, Cumberland Terrace, former United Services Club Pall Mall, now the Institute of Directors, Gloucester Terrace, Marble Arch, a 430 to 449 The Strand, Regent's Park, York Terrace, Chester Terrace, Cornwall Terrace, Clarence Terrace, Carlton House Terrace, and St James's Park. I think you'll agree, by his own mixed history, through his life, he was involved with so much of London's architecture, which still stands now. So, next time you're in London, or you're looking at pictures of London, just think about all of these places that Nash was involved in either building or designing. So, I hope you enjoyed our look at John Nash. Whatever podcast service you use to listen to this, 
please do subscribe to get updates on new shows. And also please leave us some feedback. Also, you can let me know of any places you'd like us to feature on future podcasts. And you can do this by contacting us through www.londonvisited.co.uk by emailing me directly on londonvisited at gmail.com or contacting us on Twitter and Instagram at London Visited or alternatively through Facebook on The London Visited. Next week, we have another request which has come in this very way. So if you'd like to join them in having your request featured in future, please don't hesitate to contact us. Thanks for listening. Really hope you enjoyed our podcast on John Nash and we'll see you very soon in the next podcast. Bye.